Hey guys, Jimmy Jerome here. I just want to let you know that we have a much extended edition of this week's episode available exclusively on our Patreon. Only $2 donation at patreon.com slash IABD gives you access to that, as well as our exclusive Futurama episode that was not released in the regular feed, and lots of other great content. So head to patreon.com slash IABD and donate $2 to hear the full version of this episode. <laughs> Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Talked Before. This time, we're finally there. We're into the next generation with Encounter at Farpoint. Speaking of other encounters, Encounter the It's All Been Done Radio Hour, the mothership. It's coming home to Mad Lab once again here, coming up in November. November 9th, I got it. Check it out. It's based, it, It's a modern take on those old, old serials. Check it out. Check out old episodes. IABDpresents.com. It's All Been Done Radio Hour. It's the IBD Presents, home of us. You know what? Hey, you might be one of our Patreon supporters. You might already have access to our special future Futurama episode we posted not too long ago about Star Trek, about who was here on Solomon Trek before. Get access to exclusive content for everything on the network just by getting on that Patreon. Your two bucks gets you that. If there are other levels, go there, patreon.com slash I-A-B-D. Now, I'm going to delay it any longer. You've been waiting for this since we were doing the original series. Let's get started. Next Generation... Counter Farpoint here on It's All Been Trekked Before. Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Trekked Before. Skeleton Crew. Kinda. This is Steve. Jimmy Jerome. And we have a new guest. We do. Who qualified because he did sit through an original series episode with us. He, he just did. didn't speak. I couldn't remember if he got on a mic or not. No, he didn't. Okay. But we let a that count. Yes. No, that's fair. That's fair. Let that be your last battle <laughs> film. You're yes. at the live show. <laughs> uh, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Shane. I'm uh, I, I'm in the minority here where my favorite uh, series is Voyager. So we've got a long way to go. But <laughs> I have, we'll get to it in about 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> What's your Star Trek background? How much have you seen? What, when did you find it? Um, so, like, uh, my grandpa used to always watch Next Generation, so I would catch, like, random episodes here and there. Mm-hmm. And then, like, Voyager came out, and I, from, like, episode one, started watching. So mm-hmm. um, that was, like, my full... And then I've gone back and filled in, you know, backfilled some of the stuff. I haven't watched the entirety of Next Generation, but... Um, Maybe one day. DS9? Not a fan. <laughs> That's the good one. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'll, have to give it an, I'll have to give it another shot. So far, I'm in line with it. I mean, I haven't watched all of Next Generation, and I haven't seen Deep Space Nine either. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think yeah. I just happened to see too many Ferengi episodes right off the bat. Oh, there's and a that, lot of those. That turned me off. Yeah, so. they're, they're different. Original at all? Um, only, only bits and pieces here and there. None uh, of the films or anything? Uh, a couple of films, yeah. A couple of films, couple okay. Of well, good to know where you stand, because that'll help our listeners <laughs> determine how much to, uh, take whether... My, yeah, take well, my you know, it gives you a background. It, the trash. Yeah, yeah, it gives you a background yeah, to sure. what you've done. Uh, the opening, choosing to open the series with Patrick Stewart, Space the Final Frontier, the famous logline. Uh-huh. Great idea, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really sets the tone. I mean, yeah. yeah, it sets the tone. Immediately connects it to the original series because they did that same thing except mm-hmm. wear no man instead of wear no right. one. But I mean, and there was continuing mission instead of five year mission. Right. Um, I mean, the man the one change I feel like was well prevalent throughout this episode. Not quite half the main cast was female, but so many women on screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the away missions when Q kidnapped them when they're in the tunnels, half women, half men. Uh-huh. So they were really trying to be more balanced yeah. right off the bat, which I appreciated. Mm-hmm. Well, and it points to the previous pilot where no man has gone before. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, there is an episode of the original series called Where No One Has Gone Before. I believe it's early in season one, so we'll get to it soon. Oh, you mean next generation? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, no. Wait no. a minute. Stop no. everything. <laughs> um, this was 1987. I was four years old, so I'm sure I didn't watch it at the time. <laughs> I finally figured out today when I went back and looked when this started why I didn't watch this as much. Uh-huh. I would have been 19, had a girlfriend. I actually still wasn't in college because I took like a year and a half off after high school. But um, it was also on Saturday nights at 7 o'clock because it was in syndication. So Saturday night at 7 o'clock, I was either at my girlfriend's house sure. or somewhere with my girlfriend and probably not at my house. So that's why I would see parts of it. And then in my mind, I either would see the beginning or the end of it because I'd be somewhere. Now, a lot of them would show it at 11 o'clock or they'd show it Sunday night too, but I never... So yeah, I would see bits and pieces. I rarely saw entire episodes, but it was... I think I mentioned this on some of the previous podcasts, but my mom and my sister had it on... Which is weird because they never watched original series back when mm. I watched it all the time. Well, I shouldn't say that. My sister did. My, they watched it a little bit. 
But they were the ones that always turned it on. It wasn't me that turned on Next Generation. They, were, they always had it on. So I shouldn't say I never watched an entire episode. I, I know, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I figured out why I didn't watch it as much as... And there was a little bit of, to quote Anchorman, you're not Ron. You know, it wasn't the old crew, and obviously it sure. couldn't be. But then, yeah, obviously, as we've talked about since then, we're talking about all these other series that came after that, and it's a great mm-hmm. thing. Obviously, they found something good, Star Trek. Well, this was yeah, fall of 1987. This was 21 years after the original crew. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it's set, what, 75, 80 yeah, this- years? Because McCoy's 137 in this episode. We start out with the opening credits starring Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Franks, and then also starring everybody else in alphabetical order. Which, I mean, it's an improvement over the original series, which only put Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the opening credits. So you've got the rest of the ensemble, but it, it, and it keeps those, like, captain, first officer, in, right in the sure. order. Sure. But then uh, it immediately established itself, I think, as an ensemble show, whereas the original well, series was never an ensemble show. And in my memory, and I feel like it's fairly correct at the time, the most popular person in the cast was Will Wheaton. Because <laughs> pretty much everyone else was an unknown. I mean, yeah. people knew them. I, I, uh, Patrick I Stewart. Was, Patrick Stewart yeah. had done some stuff. He was an Excalibur, and, among other things. But um, So, yeah, he was probably the best known, but he, he wasn't a household name, I would say. Mm-mm. Uh, the other thing about the beginning, and I this is what always stays with me, is they brought back the Star Trek the motion picture theme, which I yes we agree is a great theme, but yeah. it was it was and then they have elements of original series coming in there too. Mm-hmm. That was always the you know when they showed the commercials for it, when they went to commercial during mm-hmm. the show, it was always which was cool because I, I like I said I like it so, but it always kind of threw me like wait a minute again it's kind of that wait this isn't your theme song what are you doing with this? <laughs> well, see I I know I saw the movies. Um, first, but yeah. I watched a lot of Next Gen, and I associated it as the Next Gen theme song yeah. that the movies borrowed, even though it was in the movies first, um, which, it's a little bit odd that they didn't just do a totally different theme. The rest yeah. of the Star Trek spinoffs have their own original sure. theme, except, well, I mean, Discovery really plays with the original theme a lot, but yeah, yeah it, they all have their own. Uh, the music in this... Um, still a lot of orchestra, a lot of music, uh, sometimes used too melodramatically I, the original series. I noted that the stingers are only slightly subtler at some times than <laughs> yeah. the original series, which surprised me. I did not expect that. I did not remember that. But I feel like there's more of a variety of music. I mean, we'll see as we get into future episodes, yeah. but I feel like it wasn't I think as... So. The original series kept reusing their themes over yeah. and over again. Something else I noted about the ensemble cast I thought was interesting... Going forward, I mean, the original series, obviously, we only have those three leads. Right. And then Sulu, Chekhov, Yuhara, Chapel, they had very defined mm-hmm. jobs. Most of them were department heads other than Chapel. At DS9 Voyager, again, you're getting, like, the department heads of the leads of the series Enterprise. But this show, when it starts, we've got Wesley, who's just a kid on the ship. He's a main character. We've got Worf and Geordi. Uh, neither one of them are department heads at this point. They're both lieutenant junior grades. They don't have defined roles. Worf just seems to be like subbing around the bridge. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's a, um, and yeah. Jordy's similarly like, you know, he helps with engineering stuff, but he's also on the bridge and he's doing. So we've got these like junior officers there uh, who are important. They get development, they get named along with the senior officers, which I thought was really interesting. Mm. Um, also, the range of senior officers, because we've got Picard, obviously, who's a captain. Riker is a commander. Mm-hmm. Crush, Dr. Crusher is a full commander, too. She, yeah. She's similarly ranked to Riker uh, as the series starts. And then we have Troy and Data, who are lieutenant commanders, which in the original series, Spock started as a lieutenant commander and then became a commander. Everybody else is lieutenant or under. So we've got more senior officers, which I think speaks to this is a galaxy class ship, this is a plum assignment, this is like we're going to get seasoned people. Mm-hmm. But then their head of security, Yar's only a lieutenant. Right. Um, Jordi and Worf, lieutenant junior grades, but. I get we don't have any instant leads in this series, but uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that all the other department heads are like commanders or lieutenant commanders, and Yar is not. Yeah, I mean maybe uh, probably since it's that class of ship, they don't really expect that much to go as right. what happens, you know, because it's yeah. Missions. Well, and there's there's yeah, because there's civilians on the ship, right? Oh, yeah. So Fails. so it's like. You don't really need your top-level master war strategist mm-hmm. type of uh, person there, theoretically. Sure. <laughs> I made a whole list of things I want to run through real quick about just how many firsts are established in this episode uh, that carry into the series. Mm-hmm. Like they really thought out the series before this episode came. Bacard um, early on 
starts talking to Data about snooping. That seems to be a call to his love of detective work in Nixon Hill, which uh, is a main character trait for him. Uh, we get to see the engineering set, which is big. We see the bridge. We see the conference room. We, we see, see both bridges, right? Both bridges, the battle bridge. We see uh, sick bay. We see the transporter room. Like all the main sets mm-hmm. are there. Plus the b- battle bridge ready room, which I'm not sure we ever see again, yeah. which was weird. We get the the turbo lift. They show us how it works right away. Mm-hmm. They make sure they show us the families. They show us the saucer separation. They show uh, Miles O'Brien's there, even though he's not named. We'll talk about <laughs> him more in a minute. They show uh, the combat, just how they work. The transporter, how those are different. Yeah. Um, they show the uh, Jordy's visor. They stop and explain what it is. Yeah, I thought for an episode that was had to be kind of expositional, they did a pretty good job of so much just, just working it. And it it makes sense. You've got a new a new group of people come to the Enterprise, so that that, that actually it made yeah. sense. It, it didn't seem there were very few spots where it's like. I am introducing what I do, so you know who I am. There's a few spots, but not. I thought they did a pretty good job. Um, yeah, but we get the introduction to what a Galaxy Class ship is. We get the holodeck. We see Vulcan serving. We yeah. see Picard's fish is Livingston or whatever. I mean, that's big. Thing. They're name dropping the Ferengi who are major. I wrote such a diverse and plentiful and familial crew. Oh, they made it's a big, a big, big thing about that. Big thing. Uh, the one expositional thing I wrote was, I am a Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> Worf says that. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's like, very clear. Okay, we know. And he talks about honor and stuff. Just like, to, I guess. I guess to be fair, just in case you didn't know he's a Klingon, because they were. He different. didn't look like. Yeah, yeah they yeah, had a right. different look, and I. Um, they explain how the transporter work or the holodeck works. Talking about the transporter making matter. Uh, they have Q calling him Mon Capitan. We've got Picard <laughs> calling Riker number one, saying engage. We've got uh, the relationships establishing the Picard and Crusher, Picard and Wesley, Troy and Riker. Again, so, I like the number one's a nice callback to the cage. To the cage, the original yeah. pilot, yes. Only Riker has a name, he's not just number one. Right. So I guess my point is just the sheer number of things. And this episode was written by uh, Gene and DC, DC Fontana, Fontana yeah. um, right hand woman through the original series. Mm-hmm. So, like, two old hats that clearly had a grasp of this universe, how it had changed how it was the same, and we're going to tell you an interesting story, but find ways to work all this stuff in that's important for the next seven years. Or longer, if you know yeah. the films. Yeah. Well, and after, after 21 years off, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, it's almost a little Doctor Who-esque of like, hey, we've been off for so long, and now we've got to advance from the original, which was already way advanced for its time. Yeah. I mean, to go from that into its own timeline's future, in mm. the show's timeline's future... And keep it interesting and modern for, at the time in 87, mm-hmm. for that time pre- period. So it's, there's a I lot, mean, of, a lot looks, of things to... It looks a lot more advanced. Than and also to appeal to people that aren't the Trek nuts. Mm-hmm. Right. the Trek nuts were already like, well, that doesn't match up with this, which is what yeah. we do on this show. But, <laughs> but yeah, also that too. Uh, also to, I mean, you know, I think the main thing they put in there for the original people, other than the opening as we mentioned, right. is McCoy's cameo, McCoy, right. which was superfluous, not at all important. It is. It's there just for the, the old mm-hmm. hardcore fans. Just in case you weren't sure you were in the same universe. Right. 137 years old, still hates <laughs> transporters, calls Data son. He's a little bit cranky. He's he a little boy bit patronizing. Also. Yeah. Yeah, apparently not. That's, a, that's got some racist overtones to it. Uh, apparently when McCoy gets old, he also gets very Southern. <laughs> you know, when he gets drunk, when, when he's old. under the influence of yeah. whatever, and when he's hitting on ladies... And when he gets old, he gets super southern. And he couldn't do a cameo without dissing the Vulcans. Right. Uh, he just couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. I mean, we get... Throughout the next gen, we get uh, two other original cameos. Three if you count Sarek. He wasn't a lead, but he... You know, we get Scotty and we get Spock, and they both get a lot more time, a lot more plot. This was just a gratuitous cameo. Yeah. yeah. Which I can't really blame them for, but if it were any other episode, I think I'd blame them for it. Do you know why... Um, was it that he, he was the only one that wanted to be on it? I mean, I'm I sure they it. tried to maybe... Or they didn't want to overshadow, maybe. Yeah, I don't think they wanted to yeah. overshadow. I think that... I mean, I could be wrong. I haven't... I don't remember mm-hmm. uh, if explanation if I've read it. And I didn't look it up before this. But, I mean, if you had Chatner on there, that would be, that would be too much. Yeah. Or Nimoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I felt like they took the next biggest character... And we're like, That's we fair. can slip him in without being yeah. distracting. Well, yeah, because yeah. I, I mean, you don't you want to connect it, but you don't want to necessarily have uh, a direct like parallel of like, hey, remember how good this was? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, here's your bar, which 
I mean... Not right in, we'll, in your face with it, anyway. We'll judge it later, but my instinct right now, and again, I have not seen the whole next gen. I've seen sure. at least half of it, but my instinct now is we're going to actually think this is a better series. I think the original series might have some higher highs, but I think overall this show's more consistent than the original. So it's okay to invite comparisons when you've made a good product. Yeah. But like the original, it has some growing pains and trouble finding its footing, which we'll get into in the coming weeks. So, but yeah, I mean, I thought that was a solid pilot. Um, getting back in, uh, after the opening credits, we start with Patrick Stewart voiceover, which is a nice little setup. As he's walking through, we see... Uh, Variety of crewmen. Let's go ahead and do fashion because <laughs> fashion. Always do fashion. So. Uh huh. Um, no, we see the woman in the short skirt as we, the camera pans through engineering, mm-hmm. uh, which is a stour, uh, like a key part of Star Trek is women's skimpy clothing and short skirts. <laughs> but then the camera immediately finds a man in the same short skirt outfit uniform, <laughs> and I thought that was very purposeful. Uh, very interesting, and I appreciated it a lot. But not just the women are going to wear the short skirts this time around. I thought so too, and I, I just, I like I said, I liked that the ship was more populated with other people. Oh, tons! You know, we know so all the extras. bunch of constraints in the original show. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought on the planet at first, I was like, oh, there's all these different people, and I was like, nope, I'm just seeing the same forty people. But whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't sure what Counselor Troy was wearing at first because mm. it, it was. I mean, she essentially had the short skirt, sure, of some form, but it was like a one piece kind of a thing. Yeah, and then it kind of wasn't. I couldn't. It's an interesting uh, short skirt. They'll put her in body-hugging jumpsuits here shortly. Yes. But for now, she's wearing the short skirt and showing off the legs. Uh, Crusher's the only... Well, no, Crusher and Yar are both wearing pants. So it's not like all the women are running around skirts. Uh, right. Troy right. is, because... Yeah. But then again, so are some guys. Um, That's fair. The other major fashion thing, I would say, in this is all the post-World War Three post-apocalyptic outfits. The 2079 look? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 2079 is going to suck. So, it is. I'm probably not going to be around, but you guys might be. Um, I would hope. Well, I don't know. I'd be 96. <laughs> but I kind of hope it's still there. I am too. But... I mean, we'll be in the like 75th season of University. But it sounds like it's going to be yeah. terrible. <laughs> uh, it does look terrible. I mean, if those heard... clothes are any indication. We've heard a little about post-World War III before in Star Trek lore. That's true. Uh, and I really appreciate we get future history. Which we talk about the original mm-hmm. series didn't do enough. Yeah, we regret, exactly. Like, seeing our well, and I worried at first because he was in the World War II uniform. I'm like, okay, we yeah. we've done this, and then but no, they got he jumped different. forward. Yeah, but um, I do think well, the clothes were barbaric and stuff, and there was some pretty offensive stereotypes with the Asian guy and the dwarfs. Yeah, uh, I did think the outfits they were wearing, they did a really good job. And we'll get to this in a few years, but when Star Trek First Contact goes back to the same era, they do similar costumes, but not over-the-top ridiculous. I mean, I really see the similarities and the consistency of when they get to their second next-gen mm-hmm. movie. Um, but they're wearing clothing that's more toned down, but similar enough to mm-hmm. make it match, yeah. which I appreciated. Um, I mean, Q's judges' robes are freaking ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but, no, overall, I thought the design was good. A lot of interesting costumes in this, and well used. I wondered if the uniforms were still made of algae, as we learned in the... <laughs> in the animated series? Animated series? I wonder if it's still algae or something... It's either different. algae, or by now it's probably a, a replicate algae. Oh, there you go. It's yeah, probably not natural algae. Uh, and I will say... The hair is on point. Gates McFadden's yeah. hair is amazing. Yeah. Counselor Troy and Martina Sears, her hair, I remember being much greater, and I think it will be. Mm-hmm. Didn't quite do it for me. And then uh, Denise Crosby, Tasha Yar, her hair. She's uh, got the frost. The she's frost also got it. a, if, if we ever do this uh, cast it locally, Kate Jones, local actress. Oh, yeah. We'll she play, play a great Tasha hour. Yar. She's already got the hair. She does. Uh, or they'll play sisters. We'll do something like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I thought the hair was on point. Uh, they did a good job introducing all the characters, too. We got to uh, meet them all in turn. I mean, it took a half an hour before we got to the second half of the cast. Yeah, and I f- and completely Jordan. forgot we hadn't Crusher got to. Yeah. Will West. Like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, they didn't show up until minute 31 was uh-huh. the first Riker glimpse. But uh, just really getting an idea of who all these people are. I mean, more deve- I'd say the supporting cast here of Troy, Crusher, Worf, Data... Wesley, they all got more development here than most of like, uh, Sulu, Check Off Your Hair got in the whole three seasons yep. of the original series. Yep. So, Agreed. Uh, right away, some interesting stuff. Um, then Q shows up on the bridge, and Data and, I guess, uh, <laughs> Torres, what is that, that yeah. was his name? Yeah. Um, uh, Torres was played by Jimmy Ortega, um, who is best known for uh, the A-Team. 
as Mexican Captor Number Two. The wow, well, movie. Well, uh, yeah, so clearly not a. But he's got 139 credits. So he's a steady okay. working actor up to and including 2018. Um, but yeah, the, he and Data just like stand up and abandon their posts. When Q comes in, I don't know if that means the ship's great on autopilot now. I mean, I can't see Sulo Chekhov ever just jumping up from their stations at the front of the bridge. I feel like it might have happened every once in a while, but... Only in the most extreme of circumstances. Sure. Although I like the, that they swing away and they can get up and down. Yeah, I, and their seats were very comfortable. Uh, then we, Bacard says, okay, we're going to send printouts to every deck. That was to that me was the funny weirdest too. thing in the whole. That was episode. funny too. <laughs> I mean, even in the original series, they didn't use paper anymore. No. So the fact that they have readily available printouts, printouts. to send everybody. Now maybe maybe it was a holdout. Like you still say, like I'm going to tape something, but it's not really oh, a tape. Good oh, that's a, that, okay. Print yeah, out yeah, like right. here's your. That's a good here's your like a pad. Yeah, yeah like, you know what? That's, that's excellent. A, that's a good one. That's good. We never see the printouts, so you can barely yeah. be right. Yeah. See, we knew we invited Chance That's for good. reasons. That's very good. Well, good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we got lots more. Um, then the fence turns into a ball and follows them, which feels like very similar special effects to the original series. Yeah. Only, you know, better. Look looking. better, yeah, much better. Well, well to be uh, transparent, we're also watching the Blu-ray HD update of The Next Generation. Fair so. Which we did watch the updated effects in the original series, but... I know. thought that I... I was kind of surprised that I shouldn't have been because it's 30 years ago, but I still thought there were spots that looked quaint, very 87. Sure, sure. And I thought some of the mats and especially the the soundstage they look for, used for this was very like, just in case you don't, again, we're the same universe. So <laughs> the, the far point station or whatever it was looked very much like old series, yeah. which is cool. And then only a little more advanced, whatever they were, the, the area they kept Bobby, the old city. Yeah. That looked like an original series. That looked right out of friggin' so, uh, original series. <laughs> Spectre oh, of the Gun. Spectre yeah. of the Gun. Uh, and in other like episodes, it. at least. Right, exactly, yeah. So I kind of appreciated that to, to a certain extent. Only with a lot more detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then when it's time to so- separate the saucer, which... Yeah. I guess the original Enterprise separated. We just never saw it. Like, yeah, all the blueprints I, say that it separated. I hmm. didn't remember. And Roddenberry said they never had the budget to do it. So. That makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I was surprised they jumped right into that. Yeah, it's such a such a iconic piece yeah. of, uh, of a feature of the ship uh-huh. that almost unnecessary in yeah, this context. Yeah, like, they just put it right back together, but yeah. it's supposed to be kind of a test of well, uh, was, uh, Riker. No, I, I got that because it was um, the, Picard was trying to protect the civilians. That's he fair. didn't know what was going to happen with Q, That's so true. he was buying them time to escape while the battle bridge faced Q. Sure. So I thought it was reasonable story-wise. That does make sense. Interestingly, he put Worf and Commander in the saucer section, which, major foreshadowing, because you know Worf's going to go down that command track and he'll eventually get to command his own ship. And to me, the second he, like... I know he protests because he's a Klingon, and I was disappointed when he get to see him actually in command. But to me, I'm immediately thinking he's going to be Captain Defiant someday. Like, he's... I mean, I don't know. It's that foresight of having seen where that character goes that I really appreciated that, that moment of getting to be in command. And he's a pretty junior officer to be in command this early. Um, did see that... Cole Mini shows up as Battle Bridge Con Officer. It's clearly Miles O'Brien. Uh, but Riker, Data Picard, they all just call him Con, which is weird because everybody else has names in this episode. So I feel like they should have given him a name here. Um, um, all I thought of when they said Con was Con. Well, yeah, it, it's not Con Uni and Singh. That, no. that had to have confused all your yeah, serious yeah, yeah. fans. Like, what? Is he a descendant of Con? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, I don't think anybody would have got that. But, I mean, obviously... Uh, Miles O'Brien, as unnamed as he is here, will be sticking around a long time because he does how many episode, episodes of Next Gen? I'm trying to look. Which, up yeah, good for him. For, for, fifty-two. For, for, oh, that is sticking around though. Well, he did fifty-two episodes of Next Gen, and then he was a lead on DS9. For okay, seventy-three okay, episodes. Okay, that's what I'm thinking of. For all okay. seven seasons. Truly, the Gunther of. <laughs> I mean, I'd say he's more than a Gunther in the Next Gen, <laughs> in the, and true, then obviously, yeah. if Fred, <laughs> Gunther didn't go be a lead on Joey, so. <laughs> Fair. Fair point. <laughs> One more thing on the, the separating, reconnecting. Yes. Picard calls it a routine maneuver. Is he just being a, a jerk then? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think separating that is, is routine. I mean, it, it felt to me, at least if they were willing to jump on it right away, that when they're in like heavy battle situations, you send the civilians away. I think as the show went on, it was just too, um, too tedious to do it more 
often. I guess, and maybe. But I feel like in normal ship operations, they probably should separate a lot more than they. And have. maybe I'm equating it with every time, and I've railed against this in our Star Trek Three episode, which I think it was our previous episode about. Uh, we're gonna break up and blow up the ship again. We're gonna separate again, like we did in uh, Not Into Darkness. Generations. The last, the very last Star Trek. Nemesis. No, sorry. Oh, you're talking Kelvin Beyond. Universe. Yeah. Yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, Beyond. it's another one where the saucer separates and then. So I think I might be uh, mushing those together, but I was just relieved they didn't let Troy drive because you know if she drove, that ship was gonna crash. <laughs> but like, it's not, you're telling me they hey, don't let a blind guy drive the rest of the time. <laughs> they don't have they don't have some sort of automated redock sequence, right? Like it was, they made oh, it they s- do have an automated. He just Picard's like, no, 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 Riker, you don't get to use the automation. <laughs> I just want to see what you're doing. Yeah, um, but no, I, I wasn't just being sexist about Troy. We'll get. To oh, that. okay. But she drives the tr- ship twice in the films. Oh, and that's both times she crashes the ship. <laughs> so you don't let Troy drive. It has nothing to do with her being a woman. There's many fine women that can drive the ship. Just not Troy. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, then we get to the trial. Guards just gun down, man. That's brutal for network television yeah. in the era. And Especially an optimistic show, peaceful show like Star Trek. And I thought it was... I didn't understand they kill him. And it's like, oh, well... And then Q's like, dispose of him. I'm like, you're a super being. You dispose of him. <laughs> I, everyone, literally, everyone who's listening to this podcast knows how I rail against superior beings. And I have more notes on this, but ah, it just drives me nuts. Luz was not looking forward to Q because start the original series had way too many godlike beings. Uh, Picard all said the time. It, Picard said it best when he called him self-righteous life form. <laughs> life forms, but he nailed it. And I was like, you nailed it for all of us. Tired of you self-righteous <laughs> life forms. <laughs> I get that feeling, but Q is my favorite of the godlike beings that we get to meet because he will be around for so much more development. He grew on me by the end, but early at the beginning, I <laughs> did not care. He also voiced a really great uh, video game, um, Quantum Conundrum. Huh. It's a puzzle game. It's very fun, um, but it's very he, he has that sort of omnipotent sort of like mm-hmm. air to him. So it's like I was like a second the voiceover launched, I'm like I know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> I did write Q equals other annoying super creatures. And then mostly, parenthetically. He started to win me over. He started to win me over. Uh, well, give him time. I mean, so I want to talk about Q specifically, and I'm going to have to jump ahead to some notes here. But um, the relationship he has with Picard is really interesting and complex in this episode. So at first it seems like Picard is se- successfully arguing with him, like convinces Q to unfreeze Yar and like mm. talks him out of you know some of the test stuff and whatever. And there's this thing where Picard's like, well, we got a long mission ahead of us to just watch us, which, foreshadowing, where Q is just like, oh, no, just let's just look at Farpoint. But I feel like so much was set up that this was going to be a longer test than mm-hmm. those one mission. And then Q, towards the end of this episode, really, really puts his thumb on the scale in favor of Picard. He stops Picard from firing the phasers. He tells Riker to beam over to the other ship. Like, he's basically helping Picard pass this test. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, says he's already made up his mind that he's not going to find Picard guilty, and he's just trying to help shape him into, you know, whatever he's trying to, he mm-hmm. thinks the best of humanity is. The time I read, the point I hit my most, another friggin' mm-hmm. super creature, uh, was when Q literally said, you're going to be tested. I was like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> no. But this is a seven-year test. It's not a one-episode yeah, test. Yeah, but so it's I, no different, right? I still don't like it. But maybe, you can, maybe I can be talked into it. But Well, I have actually never watched All Good Things. I've only read the novelization, the finale. Oh, okay. But it really is a bookend of he started the test in the pilot, and in the series finale, he'll complete the test. <laughs> well, here's, so I kind of like that. Here's my aspect. thing. How come they're only prosecuting humans? I just think he's picking on Picard. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's... Because, I mean, you got Klingons, you got everybody else on there. Why not pick on them? I mean... They even bring up the free... Even on the ship itself, is he just going to wipe out the humans but leave, like, right. Warf in charge? Right. And the Vulcans yeah. under Death Below Deck? It seems arbitrary and capricious, which... I did like that Q was using some good legal terms, like summary judgment. <laughs> I will say this. Um, everyone listening to this podcast knows I will, at the end of the day, Kirk will still be my favorite sure. Picard. I really enjoy Picard in this episode. He's great. Oh, yeah. And his, when he makes bold proclamations or arguments, mm-hmm. much more convincing than, than Kirk slash Shatner. It's just like, all right. And he could just be saying, he could be make, speaking made up words and I'd still be like, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think he's making a lot of sense here. Well, I mean, a- he says it convincingly and yeah. with that voice and everything. It's just like, all right, I like this guy. He's right. 
that guy's got it. I mean, you might get a little upset with me about this, but I think <laughs> Patrick Stewart's a better actor than William Shatner. Uh, probably. And I think that's yeah. part of it. Yeah, well, and it's... I mean, I like Shatner. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm still going to be more of a Shatner guy, too. But some of that stuff in nostalgia, same with Kirk and all that. But, um... No, I, I love Picard in this, uh, and Patrick Stewart. It's great. It's like, but he's right, a very cool this guy. he's a very different captain. Yeah, and I and I love it. And like, I, yeah, the way he. I mean, there are multiple times this episode where he's telling his junior officers, "Yeah, question me, challenge yeah. me." Yeah, like he brought Riker on, and he basically, you know, had that conversation with him about, "You're going to protect me, right? You know, that's your first. You know, you're going to follow my orders, right. except when you're protecting right. me." And Riker's like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Well, keep me from being dumbass." And then he tells Yar like. What was, I'm really asking your advice here. Uh-huh. And there's somebody else later in the episode, yeah. he says something similar. And uh, well, Riker, like, asks if he can speak freely, Picard's like, always. Yeah. So that's not the way Kirk managed things. Well, and it starts with him being like a by the book kind of guy. And then it, yeah. obviously, those kind of things you just referenced, it, it changes. But yeah. Picard is better suited to the ensemble. Kirk, the type of captain Kirk was, it made sense why there were only a couple stars in that show. Picard, the way he manages the ensembles, the better. Well, and I just think the way you... Literally, this episode's like, okay, uh, Riker's going down to the planet. Mm-hmm. He's handling that stuff. Yeah. Picard's going to handle the, all the talking. Yeah. Kirk is both those guys. It, Kirk, takes, it takes two people to equal Kirk. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I was... I'll say it. I was about to say... No, you... <laughs> it, it takes a whole crew to equal Kirk, because they all have to talk about it, but... Um, I was going to say Kirk was going to fire phasers uh, and doom them, but then I stopped for a second because I'm not sure he would have fired phasers because Kirk has that gut instinct. Right. Kirk might have sensed that something was up. Right, right. Whereas Picard, let's investigate. You guys go over here. You check this out. You scan. Jordy, go look with your visor and see what you can see. But yeah, and and not all the Shatter Sparks aren't Mm -hmm. fault. Uh, Some of it's writing in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s in that, yeah, if if, if Kirk hadn't fired the phasers, I'm not going to fire them. We're not going to do this. Whereas the <laughs> yeah. car is like, here's why we're not going to do it. Yeah. And, blah, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, that's very. Well, very part of the thing is if you invite other people's advice and opinions, then you also have to explain your own. That's Whereas Kirk that's never invited it, so he didn't have to explain right, himself. Right, right. Well, and, uh, you know, how, how long of a gap between the. Like the 70 years. years. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, in, the, in, the, in, in the story. In the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's a, lot, that's a lot of, like, administrative time. So, like, the. Like um, styles uh, of like the leadership have yeah. changed. I mean, look at the last seventy-five. Yeah. You know, like generalship and all that. So, the original Star Trek was kind of a western. It was mm-hmm. very exactly. much frontier wild west. My Picard's time, the galaxy's more subtle. Yeah, it's more yeah. civilized. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it was the western and or you know Horatio Hornblower out on the ship. I have a hard time <laughs> judging whether Kirk or Picard's the better captain. I find Kirk more enjoyable to watch as a captain, even yeah. though I think Stewart's the better actor. Um, Patrick Stewart, but uh, they're both the right captain for their time. Yeah, I don't. I think Kirk would have trouble operating in Picard's time, and I think mm-hmm. Picard would have trouble operating in Kirk's time. Well, and I think flashing back a couple weeks ago, Wrath of Khan, it's already Kirk's already starting to feel like a relic. Yes, you know? he is and starting so to be fun. a relic. Yeah, at the end in the and, movies, and so yeah, he definitely could not exist in. The they time. could have set next gen fifty years earlier, and it still would have worked. Yeah. They didn't have to do 75, 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Though I kind of like it. I mean, Peace with the Klingons, that right away is uh-huh. something different. Because in the movies, they're still fighting them. Right. Um, so, and peace enough that you're going to allow a Klingon on the bridge? That's not like we just made peace last year. <laughs> yeah. That's like, okay, we're comfortable And I did here. like they didn't make a big point of explaining that. Yet, no, and nobody, bl- was cool. and nobody blinked at yeah. it. So you know it's just accepted. Yeah. yeah. In the scene, I think it's the first scene with Q, there's literal shade on Picard during the scene. <laughs> there's some weird lighting in this yeah. episode. Yeah. It was harking back to the old series when they just have the, the light on their eyes mm-hmm. and everything else would be dark. It was kind of weird. I was, it wasn't quite that striking, but right. there was some it weird was lighting. weird. Yeah. And then I liked when he just said he was John Luke Picard because I just thought of the refreshment song uh, Banditos and he says, I'm John Luke Picard, the United <laughs> Federation of Planets. So I don't put my notes to Riker's introduction. Do you have more before Riker? I, uh, just a couple. Um, just in general, Denise Crosby. Um, I know she doesn't last long. No. Spoiler alert. Sorry, everybody. Um, okay. we, won't get, we won't get into why. But. When we get up to like shows that are a year or two old, we might watch for spoilers. But next gen's yeah, pretty like, much. 35 yeah. years yeah. old at this age, 40 years old at this uh, point. And the okay. thing I remember most about her is she appeared in Playboy right after it came out. But it was actually a... Like a nine-year-old, she'd done it nine years before. Oh, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't have that issue. I have the 1988 issue. So, hmm. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she was the granddaughter of Bing Crosby. 
Was she really? I think it's granddaughter How did or niece I never know or that? something. Yeah. How did I never know that? I like Denise Crosby. Yeah. Um, yeah, she doesn't even make it through the whole first season. But then she, she comes come back, back later. later. Just briefly, yeah. like guest spot. Not, yeah. Yeah, you'll, we'll get to that. Picard says they can tuck tail between the legs, so clearly dogs are still a big thing well, in the future. Well, Janeway we... has dogs oh, okay. uh, in Voyager, so yeah. yeah, dogs are still a thing. Uh, I thought it was an interesting conversation that they have with uh, Q where they're like, hey man, it's it's the 2300s, like, you can't keep blaming us for stuff from 300 years ago. And he's like, can I? And yeah. I thought it was similar, but not. it's not perfectly analogous to not now it's like at what point when you get woke <laughs> or is yeah. it okay because i mean i know i've done i'm much older so i lived in a bad here and i did a lot of bad things True. uh or just stupid ignorant things um i can't even blame it on that probably the last 10 years i have um <laughs> but i feel like i've learned more mm-hmm. you know every day i learn more and more i guess at what point are you still punished and i feel like somehow this episode kind of yeah. hit on that in that little moment and it obviously doesn't apply to this moment of hashtag me too and all that stuff, but obviously it applies to kind of in that that year, like whether it's Vietnam or mm-hmm. World War II or whatever you're whatever you're addressing there. Uh, so I thought that was a cool little thing that Roddenberry and Fontana worked in there, uh, even if they didn't, and I, and they didn't need to blabber. I thought it was just a cool little thing they worked in there. So that that just struck me kind of funny. Grievously savage is I think that's what Q calls yes. it, which is also my favorite punk band. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. This is the trial, or this is when uh, Data is replaying the stuff that he's replaying when they froze Torres or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cameras on the Enterprise are still great, and they do their oh, own. Yeah. They're the best eye film or whatever ever. They <laughs> they read. They're right there. They edit. They zoom in. They zoom out. <laughs> Talk about like when they show Riker the recap. Yeah, they, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, they on show the those different bridge. angles. Yeah, they do, and it, it's very edited like there's definitely things missing yeah. from the scene which I appreciate because in the original I feel like they would have just showed the whole scene but they're like next gen's like we gotta get moving and they did not include any clips of the courtroom which I appreciate well I was gonna say that also shoots back to the menagerie when you also had but that was yeah. the Telosians messing with I know but yeah, yeah. you don't know that until the end we don't know that until now but Riker we only saw him watch like 20 seconds of clips and it yeah. almost looked like it was over. Yeah. But there was clearly like 51 minutes right. between they left him there and right. he goes to talk to Bakar because that's how long the saucer was supposed to get Just there. give me the highlights. Uh, so he did. That's so that's... after he watches the clips they must have been like now let's talk about the courtroom. <laughs> that's why That's why I'm convinced that we need a, uh, uh, I want to do a web series spinoff that's just um, like Star Trek uh, AV department. <laughs> you know that giant screen is going to go out at least oh, after a big battle. Yeah. Oh, You're going to need your yeah. AV team yeah. to come fix it. That's, 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 that's come we never not, saw the AV team yeah. on Star Trek. They're not just the, engineering. The garbage that's... crew or the custodial crew or whatever. Oh, yeah. the new yeah. animated series yeah. Lower Decks. Yeah. 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 See, so they they could, they maybe they'll work the AV club into it. It's like a subdivision of engineering. So we meet Riker. One of the first things he does he's talking to the... Zorn, played by Michael Bell. Uh, Michael Bell, who's known for the Transformers animated series. Oh. Played a number of voices in the 80s. Oh. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. Mm. G.I. Joe, Sonic the Hedgehog. So he's a voice actor, primarily. He's done some voices in Star Wars Rebels more recently. Um, still active. So yeah, he's still around. But So Riker's talking to him, and he like puts out his hand to shake his hand. And Riker... Like, puts up the other hand and makes him switch hands yeah. in the shape, which was a real BD energy move. Uh, I'm not going to say it on the clean podcast, so you guys get it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there was another scene later where Bacard puts his hand out to shake Riker's, and I couldn't remember if Bacard was putting out the correct hand or not, but the scene cuts before we see Riker oh. shake his hand, oh, and I yeah. wanted, I really wanted to see, I, I was hoping... And maybe this was the way it was, but they just didn't show it. I was hoping Picard also stuck out the wrong hand, but this time Riker shook it instead of making Correct, a switch yeah. <laughs> to just show that scene. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there just wasn't time for it, but I felt like that was a callback, the handshakes there. So then we get... Uh, oh, something I noticed about this point in the episode is just how many sounds of the ship there are whenever they're on the ship. Uh-huh. Like the engine and the mm-hmm. background noises. There were some in the original series, but so much more present on The Next mm-hmm. Generation that... Well, and they, 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 those sounds pretty much never change. Like, even through, like, Voyager, they're, they're pretty much the same sounds. Like, the yeah. engine sounds are pretty similar. And they're all copyrighted, um, and you can't steal those sounds and use them in your own works. Mm-hmm. I appreciate the new love theme when Troy and Riker saw each other. Yeah. 
I mean, we've talked about this when we did the motion picture. Yeah. So the Star Trek Phase 2 was the series they didn't end up making in the 70s, the television series, and they had scripts written and sets built. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these first season Next Gen episodes are just adapted scripts from Phase 2, which would have been Kirk's crew. Mm. But they added a couple new characters that were in the motion picture that were basically Riker and Troy. <laughs> they had a history. There, mm-hmm. well, you know, One was the first officer, Will Decker. <laughs> um, and so it felt like... This that relationship immediately were like if you're a fan of the movies it's Ilya and Decker again mm-hmm. even though they get more time I will say the Imzadi thing um, there are Star Trek novels are of mixed quality there's some really good ones yeah. there's some pretty bad ones yep. but Star Trek Imzadi for a long time and it may still be my favorite Star Trek novel it's written by Peter David who's like the best of those authors he does a lot of comic book writing too um, he also is the one that's more likely to put sex in his novels okay. and Imzadi has a lot of graphic sex in it but it's the it's the backstory of Riker and Troy and their so when we talk really about good. that when we do an episode on that it's just going to be a lot of bleeps I mean <laughs> if you <laughs> order the book I'll do an episode it's either on it's going to be a lot of bleeps or a lot of euphemisms <laughs> uh, there is an Imzadi 2 also written by Peter David not as good gotcha. but um, I highly recommend reading the book Star Trek Imzadi because it, it gives you that whole backstory of them falling in love and their fallout. But Card's uncomfortableness with children. I never bought it. I mean, yes, Patrick Stewart seems weird with children. But it always seemed like a weird character trait to me. Because, like, he gets very paternal to Wesley as time goes on. Is but the idea just this... to try to establish that he doesn't like kids but Wesley wins him over, kind of? I guess. But he won him over, like, right away in this first episode. <laughs> Um, and we see him with his nephew Renee later on and he's really paternal with him when we go in, in the movie Star Trek Generations when Picard goes into the Nexus to see his ideal life he has kids so I don't huh. know that I buy I don't think they're consistent with his feelings on children now did uh I don't remember. Did they explicitly state he doesn't like children, or was it just he was awkward around Wesley? No, he said well, this he episode said he doesn't like children. He's, he's not, not a, comfortable. He's not a family man. Yes. Okay. He told Riker one of his jobs was to keep him like genial around children in this episode. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, okay. Well, so, see, does that point more to like a Kirk kind of thing of like, I never had kids, so I have thoughts about that, and I feel bad about being married to my chip or whatever kind of a thing? I don't know. That he's trying to keep... I mean, clearly, Galaxy Class is the first class where they have, like, families on board, mm-hmm. so Picard's not used to serving with families, but it still feels... I mean, it's such stark contrast to when we get Cisco here in the next series. He's already got a teenage son, and so he's a very comfortable father. Um, so that I guess that's one of the things they did to draw mm-hmm. a contrast. But I don't know. I felt like Picard and Wesley's relationship was always pretty easy. Well, I did like when Wesley comes on the ship and he knows recognizes the, everything on the panel. Yeah. And they fixed that pesky little problem. I know. Potentially blasting someone into space. They took that button off. They took the button off the control. <laughs> in the original series, there's a button on the chair that if you open it, like, shoots a pot off and somebody could die. Chris <laughs> accused of murdering a guy. Oh my which goodness. is perfect because that harkens back to another court, court yeah. marshal. Another court scene. But then yeah. every time there's an episode where he hits a button on the chair, you're like, oh my god, has he hit the right button? <laughs> <laughs> but he just killed somebody else. Because <laughs> the whole court argument is he just hit the wrong button. You're yeah. like, why is there a button on his chair that just, does yeah. that? <laughs> and so for, like, the first ten minutes, I was like, this was a crush is all right. Yeah. And then he falls in that creek, and I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> now I see why people hate this kid. But we'll see. I, I never, I never hated Wesley. him, I but I know lots of people did. I, like I feel like Will. they've come around, because I don't all the, the geeks love Will Wheaton now? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think right? so, yeah. Also, Big Bang Theory. doesn't mean they love Wesley Crusher. That's fair. Sure. That's fair. Also, uh, well, this is later in the episode, but we have a little bit more crossover with Orville uh, regarding Wesley. I thought it be in a future episode. Well, what? I re- you're going to have to remind One me of the this. characters, one of the actors from uh, Orville mm-hmm. uh, was one of Wesley's friends. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll yeah. get to that. Yeah. Yes. I so, did see that. A little future, that is, so, little yeah. future tease. We see the USS Hood, which was Riker's old ship. Uh, it is an Excelsior class, which... By this point, they've just done four Star Trek movies. We met the Excelsior in the third one. So yes. it's a pretty new ship for them. So now it must be a really old ship yeah. when Riker's leaving it. When they said the hood, I have to admit, I thought they meant the hood for a second. <laughs> it's from the hood. Oh. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> okay. <"That's>, okay. <laughs> what Earth doesn't have hoods anymore. What are they saying exactly <laughs> about this other ship? Interesting, interesting. interesting choice, though, to, to also... Name this Enterprise, mm-hmm. this this ship. Like I just you know for a confusion's sake. Oh right, right. you know like. Yeah. 
Oh, I think that was one of the things they were trying to do to keep the co- continuity. To keep sure. Right. And so you're D, yes. which uh, yeah. we had recently in the films lost the original Enterprise. Mm. That's right. Or had not, do we meet the Enterprise A at the end of Star Trek 4? Or is that not until the so. fifth movie? I think it might be the fifth. I thought well, maybe, maybe it was the end of the four. We, unfortunately, we had to switch our order, so we haven't recorded Star Trek 4 yet. So, yeah, we we should have recorded If you listened before. last week, we'll have already answered this question. <laughs> well, it was been a few weeks ago, because we had a hiatus, right. and mini hiatus right. and stuff. But yeah, we would have already talked about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Enterprise A is introduced in the movies, so I'm glad they skipped a couple in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get to see both the B and the C eventually on screen. But for now, we skip from, you know, mm-hmm. A, the original... Which didn't have any letters, and then yeah. there was the A mm. to the D. Ah, intrepid class ships always were my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Constitution was never my favorite. I know it's the original Enterprise, but it's not, not my favorite. <laughs> Blasphemy. Uh, Blasphemy. I'm sorry. I do like the Defiant class, too. We'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Riker is quite the ladies' man. Well, that's, earlier. yeah, that's throughout the whole series. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, giving Troy no. a cold shoulder, though. Yeah, he is. Well, he's, you know. <laughs> he clearly <laughs> has his heart broken, but he's the one that yeah. left her. I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah, this is probably what made him shave his beard in the first place. Yeah, exactly. I think it's season two we get the beard. Yes, that's yeah. actually all I, I spent about five minutes on that this episode. Like, when does the beard come in? Mm-hmm. And in season two. Okay. We get, Worf and Yar are both really quick to jump to aggression in this uh-huh. episode. I mean, tell your security team to calm down a little bit. They're on a galaxy class starship. Mm-hmm. When Troy, I can't remember. Whatever, whatever, whichever she connects with things, I can't remember what she's connecting with the first. And she started the first time she started doing the pain. Yes, that was my next call back too. to Devil in the Dark. Yeah, from the Horde. So essentially, what she's doing all the time is a hands-free mind meld. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's, it's she's using her Bluetooth, but she can only set the emotions, wired and not the whole thought. Okay, well that's fair. Yeah. Spock gets the whole thought when he touches you. That fair enough. He, yeah, but when he's not touching, he just gets emotions too. So he's she well, that's just fair. like Spock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But really, the more Spock esque character is. Well, Data's kind of Spock esque. Yeah. Because yeah. he's. Although he's also Pinocchio, which, like, okay. just in case you weren't getting who Data is, they go ahead and call him Pinocchio right in the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> which, you're like, yeah, no. He, yeah, he's Pinocchio. Mm. Interestingly, when Wesley goes on the bridge, they did that POV shot where we get to see the bridge from Wesley's mm-hmm. perspective. It's actually really effective in the scene. Mm-hmm. I feel of like giving. You've already seen the bridge, but now you're getting a fresh yeah. eyes perspective. Well, and uh, didn't uh, Kirk's son comes on and. Oh, maybe. He has the same. It's not the same point of view camera shot. It's just he. He's that like, oh, I'm look of wonder. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh. David. Then Picard yells, get off the bridge, both of you, to Crusher and Wes. <laughs> and I get why he'd yell at Wes. Would you really yell at your chief medical officer or commander, get off the bridge? No. Like, no. She has the right to be out there. She's a senior officer. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe there was an injured patient that she should have been taking care of. But there wasn't. <laughs> at one point he says, Picard to CMO. And I thought that was interesting, because I don't think we've ever heard the chief medical oh, yeah. officer called CMO before. Yeah. And I don't think he does it, like, ever again. Yeah, no. <laughs> it sounds like something you need to make to get into your doctor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm on a CMO. <laughs> uh, at one point, Riker calls Troy lieutenant, which I feel is more him throwing shade, because Data and Troy are both lieutenant commanders. And if they don't call lieutenant commander, they shorten to mm. commander. They don't shorten it to lieutenant. So I feel like Riker's throwing some real shade at Troy when he calls her Lieutenant Troy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's he's still a little bitter. <laughs> There's a great line where Picard is like, the unknown is what brings us out here. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's a very Roddenberry line, and yeah. a very Mission of Star Trek line. Mm-hmm. I appreciated getting it. They talk about the creature being able to turn energy into matter. Yes. And how they've never seen that. But I feel like we saw it like 40 times in the original series. We did. So I didn't... We did. I, but they haven't personally seen oh. it. Oh, <laughs> I've never seen this before. Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> after they settle space, yeah. and Kirk, after Kirk's time, the, the unusual gets a lot less common. <laughs> so now you can go 40 years serving in Starship service and not see those yeah. things. Uh, speaking of space, my next note is about the space jellyfish. I've or got no space man, too. Portuguese man of war, if you will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, or Portuguese space man of war. I don't know how <laughs> you would actually do that. but uh, And I also appreciate their... Well, I guess they're not binary. They were just mates. They don't say whether they're male or female do that. So I wrote gender's binary. Yeah. That's well, I did well, think slightly that. blue and was slightly pink. Yes. Yes. So I give them credit. The blue one was the one injured the new rescue. As I say, yeah. The pink one gave well, that makes sense. Uh, I felt so, like that right, was so purposeful. It probably is binary. I forgot, but yeah. In the original series, we established the gender is binary it's, it's and universal. That, Every yeah. species just as male or female. Universal. Male and female. Yeah. Uh, well, they, didn't, not... they didn't know as much back then. <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> this is the future, Shane. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in there, they didn't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, no, I think the director, Corey Allen, who directs five episodes of Next Gen, that's one of the things he's best known for, and four episodes of DS9, um, as well as directing Rebel Without... Oh, no, he was an actor in Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, wow. Uh, but anyway, I think he like, had a thing for those jellyfish, because they had long, lingering shots of those they did. jellyfish, was... like... <laughs> Sex in space. Could have seen the handshake. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it felt very, I mean, it was almost like in searching the motion picture, we're going to spend the long lingering shots on the Enterprise because uh-huh. it's so pretty. Right. He's like, oh, we're just going to stay on these jellyfish. Yeah. I, we got a lot of jellyfish. Credit for practical effects, though. They, yeah. Uh, I thought I thought those were pretty good. Well, was yeah. already way better than anything in the original series. <laughs> I thought, like, I it was felt movie like, level effects. Yeah, I felt like a lot of the money went to that yeah. end. The end well, it was, it, 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 that, the, especially the jellyfish effect mm-hmm. really reminded me of um, Ghostbusters, yeah. where it was like that sort of like uh, layered, yeah. like practical. Uh-huh. Pump. You could even yeah. you could even sort of see where the strings, the strings lifted the, <laughs> the tentacle. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought the ending where all the the matter that the jellyfish were uh-huh. making into or the energy, energy. they were into matter turned mm-hmm. felt like a cage menagerie homage because at the end of both those episodes, essentially, we see that everything's just an illusion. Mm-hmm. Created by the Talusians. I think this was a lot closer to the cage than where No Man's Gone before. I think yeah. Ron and Barry at this oh, yeah. point was like, you owe me, I can do the pilot I want, <laughs> I'm doubling down the cerebral and the thinking aspect, instead of this being a shoot. Well, yeah, yeah where No Man's Gone before is the, all right, we're going to run into God, but we're going to beat the crap out of him. Right. We're going to get down Kirk to... Kirk and Gary fist fighting. Yep. Um, and yep. this one was much more like the cage, where like you have to think through the problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this this one especially, and this was the biggest like point that I had, especially after like rewatching it for the first time. Um, this is just a wild ride for a pilot. Yeah, like mm-hmm. for for this to be the the starting point of a whole new mm, yeah. you know era of Star Trek, like it's pretty out there. Um, sure. You know, with Q and the like wacky mm-hmm. like Qness of it all, and then like space jellyfish and like. As it started off so kind of grounded of, like, you've got the gravitas of Picard and mm-hmm. all this, and then it's goofy in a way that is just, for a pilot anyway... But it still takes so, itself so seriously. Right. It's, yeah. such a, it's such a risk that yeah. I'm surprised they took. Um, well, I think they'd earned it at that point, because the movies were doing well. Mm. They were making a lot of money. Yeah. Um, well, and I also the show think, had a built-in fan base. Yeah, and I also think it was syndicated, so they were just... In- Answering to the production company and not not the network, network. <laughs> doesn't yeah. mean they didn't get notes, obviously. Sure, but, right. But still, but I think that that probably there were a lot of things going in its favor that allowed them to be bolder here. I yeah. think, mm-hmm. uh, and then of course we get they tried to do an original series ending where we have to do a laugh line, but then they followed up with Stuart Patrick Stewart Picard saying, "Let's see what's out there." Engage, yeah. yeah. Of course, you got to have the engage in the end. <laughs> of but it felt like the end of an original, original series. We're yeah. like, let's give us a little laugh line here to end it. They did that so many times in the original series. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my last one's my alternate episodes. Okay. Uh, I have two. Sure. One's called The Cage, and the other's called Where No Man's Gone Before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real episode. Yes. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> my alternate episode, I don't know, Q just kisses Picard, I guess. The tension's uh, there. I'll have a third alternate episode. It's Kirk, and he talks Q into self-destructing. I, I, yeah, seeing this this episode with Kirk there yeah. uh, as the Star Trek Phase 2 episode. That would be interesting. Yeah. Real Rumpelstiltskin type. That's, oh. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> or Trelane came back yeah. instead of Q. Yeah. 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 That's what I would say. He is a Q. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. I just think it's a really strong pilot. I think it is. it's really yeah. well put together. Yeah. I know Shane, you really want to come on this episode because you said you had some thoughts. Do we cover some of them, or do you? Still yeah, I mean, mostly, mostly just like from a. So I do a lot of um, film stuff, mm-hmm. and um, I watch a lot of television. Sure. Uh, and that was, I mean, mostly just about the pilot just being such a unique starting point for a show. Where I mean, yeah, you've got your typical pilot intros where you're, you know, introducing the cast and all their like sort of quirks and and stuff, but just the fact that uh, it was such a out there mm-hmm. episode yeah. for a pilot yeah. specifically for a pilot like this I could easily see this being more of a like um, you know third or fourth episode but the you know a pilot's more like an action yeah, type yeah. like grab them but again I'm thinking in like now times versus yeah. back mm-hmm. then when you could be a little slower you could be a little yeah. 
you know, take your pacing. Well, they got two hours, which I think was still pretty unusual for a pilot in those days. But this was eventually split into two parts for syndication, but it was always intended to be one two-hour episode. It was never intended to be two separate episodes. Mm-hmm. And if watching it as we watched it on the Blu-ray where it was just one, mm-hmm. there's no obvious break. There's yeah. no, like, yeah. it's a continuous story. Yeah. And I, I'd have to go back and look. I, I'm wondering how long the syndication deals were. Like, were they already locked in for... I feel like they were locked in for a few years. I think they were. Where, I mean, some stations yeah. were like, I'll take three years of Star Trek. That I think mm-hmm. that gave them a little more yeah. courage. Star Trek as was opposed such to, a I gotta property. jump in with... Yeah. Such a big property at the time. It was. I mean, the yeah. movies were rolling. Yeah. yeah. The fourth movie had recently come out. Yeah, it didn't kill really well. Yeah. Yeah. Khan did really well. Yeah. So even even search was a little dip, but it wasn't bad. Box office wise, it still did, well. still did really well. Because well. yeah. the budget was low enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I could see. I mean, they just did a good job of melding introduction with, mm-hmm. like, not just mm-hmm. giving you. Like, let's hold your hand and introduce everything. It well, was all in there. But. And the other part of that is, it, is also overcoming what I mentioned at the beginning, which is. You're not. You're not Ron. You're not the yeah. guys, and yeah. So that's tough to do, and I think they, I think they got there. Um, and obviously, I think that's the other thing of making sure that they know, people know this Picard. This isn't your captain. This yeah. isn't necessarily your crew. There are some similarities you're going to find. This is still the 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 soul of Star Trek. It's right. that same universe and sense of here's the mes- the mission of Starfleet and yada yada yada. Um, but There's still, Forrest yeah. Kelly giving his blessing by appearing. Yeah, yeah. yeah but still, well, the fact that Gene Roddenberry and Dor- DC Fontana writing the script. Yeah, I think yeah. went a long way as well. Um, I mean, DC was Roddenberry's assistant through the original, mm-hmm. but she wrote a bunch of the animated mm-hmm. series and stuff. Which honestly, her animated series episodes weren't great. This is yeah. by far the best thing we've mm-hmm. seen so far from her. Well, By she far. did write yesteryear. Right? Yeah, this was way better than yesteryear. Well, <laughs> fair, but that was <laughs> yes, the best animated. Yesteryear was the best animated yeah. episode. You're right. I want to say she did not have Q in her draft. Her draft was oh, just the really? far point station aliens. And when they decided to make it two hours, Roddenberry went in and added Roddenberry Q. Roddenberry always wanted God. He, he always wanted, wanted God. God creatures in there. <laughs> Constantly. And then Q wasn't enough for him, so then Star Trek V, he's going to take Kirk yep. to beat God. Yep. We'll get to that. That'll be coming up in mid-season two of Next Gen. There towards the end. Let's get to our ranking. Uh, how's this compared to other Next Generation episodes? Uh, it's, the, it's my favorite. It might be my so. favorite so far. Yeah. Um, by far. <laughs> In all seriousness, I mean, I've seen all of season one, right. and I think this is going to stay near the top. I, I think it's... A, and I, you know, I think in a lot of lists of even the entire series of Next Generation, mm-hmm. I think this is usually in yeah. at least uh, at least the top ten, for sure the top ten, usually the top five, um, yeah. I think... I think un- undoubtedly everyone, most everyone has the same yeah. opinion on number one, um, which we'll get to eventually. Um, but I think I think it's usually in the top five as as hey, this look at what this started. It's it's a solidly written episode. And um, if we're look if we're trying to compare it to drill series episodes, which we're not going to do week to week, weren't Cajun Menagerie? But I, I feel like they were in our top ten or fifteen. For, or not, Cajun was a little lower. Cajun, 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 Cajun or No Man, four. yeah. Cage was number two, I think, overall. Yeah. Under and I know I kept pushing trap. where no man has gone before. <laughs> yeah, and it was up there. It yeah. was, but I mean, I'm thinking if this were an original series episode, if we were ranking among the original series, I think this would be on the high end. It'd be up there, yeah. I don't think it, it beats the Atlantic forever by any means, but I think it's no. I think it's within the top ten original series episodes. It'd be, yeah, it's somewhere in that range. <laughs> men, women of Star Trek. This is going to be hard for yeah. this episode. Uh, because we normally said we're trying to find who is oh attractive. I know who I'm going with mm. um, but you're not supposed to pick a lead character yeah and so that limits you especially in an episode like this Steven uh, I forgot until this moment that I, or, uh, the girl that checks out girl Riker. that checks out Riker's butt yeah I liked her her spirit <laughs> <laughs> yeah I really want to say quoi I really want to go with Dr. Crusher but I can't right so I'm going to go with Q. He can turn right. into a pretty That's girl fair. for me. That's fair. <laughs> and there's a magnetism about him uh, that is like, I know he's a jerk, but I kind of want to see what he does next. The jellyfish. The, which ah, one? Because, blue or pink? Uh, I mean, either. You don't well, know yeah. which one's which. Blue, yeah, the, blue because it's a sort of a overcoming your obstacles type uh, mm-hmm. situation there. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. The hanging on, surviving. Mm-hmm. I like mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So that's our rankings. Uh, next week. We'll be talking the second episode of the series, which, once more, I'm unprepared and have to wait for IMDb to get me over there. 
Episode two is The Naked Now, huh. which is a playoff of The Naked Time. The, of course. The career of the oppressed infected with a virus that causes them to behave as if they were Here we go. There's a lot in that first season that repeats the original series. Kind of like the animated series did. Yeah. Unsuccessful. Um, the other thing we're going to get in this episode is uh, Shimoda will be showing up. Jim Shimoda, who is a iconic Next Generation character. Huh. Um, I don't think he was in a bunch of episodes. I was trying to look. No, he's just in this one episode, but uh, he's a character that is memorable. So we'll get we'll get that next week. All right. Uh, this was a little bit longer because it was a pilot. We'll probably be back under an hour for the most part after sure. this week. Uh, until then, uh, should we? Do we need to change the ending line or we keep? Do it? we say engage? I mean, I mean, it's still live long and prosper, though, right? Is, is yeah. That change that doesn't. I well, mean, it's up to us if we want to change it or keep it. I guess we should keep it. I'm fine with keeping Thanks. it. So live long and prosper. And engage. (laughs) (laughs) It's All Been Done presents... Who's got the time?